Welcome to everybody and um, welcome to the 22nd webinar series on the economics of COVID-19. I'm Isabel Lara, Lara uh, and I'm a master's student at SOAS studying international finance development with the moderating the session of today. Uh, it's the last one of the um, spring summer season. However, there will be more webinar series from September onwards. So we will just have to wait a little bit. And this series have been co-organized by the SOAS department, economics department, and the SOAS Open Economic Forum. The topic of today is cushioning the effects of COVID-19 in the global south, the role of development finance, and the global financial safety net. This topic will be presented by Stephanie Griffith-Jones and by Ulrich Ball. Uh, Stephanie is, current, is currently the Financial Market Program Director at the Initiative for Policy Dialogue at Columbia University. She's working on global capital flows, especially reference to flows in emerging markets and microeconomic management of capital flows in Latin America, Eastern Europe, and Sub-Saharan Africa. She writes proposals for international measures um, to reduce volatility of capital flows and for international finan financial reforms reports. She has written a report that right now I'm going to put here in the chat box, which all of you are going to be able to have access to it. It has been published for the from the Center of Global Development and and, and Regis Maradona and Jose Antonio Campo have collaborated on this publication as well. Then Ulrich Paul, uh, he's a reader in economics at just uh, and founding director at the SOAS Center for Sustainable Finance. He led the author, he is the lead author of the 2018 report commissioned by the United Nations Environmental Climate Change and the Cost of Capital in Developing Countries. And he has ad acted as an advisor to several governments, central banks, international organizations, and development agencies. Ulrich will focus on the financial safety net and the issues related to debt, and then Stephanie. Stephanie, who will talk first, she will address the role of development banks and development financial institutions. So, whenever you are ready, you can start the webinar. Well, thank you very much. And uh, can everybody hear me? Is it okay? Yes. yes. So, thank you very much to Ulrich for the invitation. Um, I'm I'm delighted to. I think I think there's a bit of interference. I think those people who are not speaking, it's better if they can turn off uh, the sound. If I may suggest that. So I will speak first, basically about the, the increasing role, the sort of renaissance we can say of development banks and public development finance. As many of you know. Um, in the times of the Washington Consensus, there was a belief in so-called private, efficient financial markets. And the, the role, if you like, of the invisible hand in the private financial sector. But uh, particularly since the global financial crisis of 2007 and 2009, uh, it has become very clear that uh, financial mark, private financial markets on their own are very insufficient to finance development. In the first place, they are very procyclical, or we can call them fair weather friends. So when things are going very well, they're very happy to fund both domestically and internationally uh, countries and companies. But when there are problems, and when there is uncertainty, like there was in the global financial crisis, but also as there is now under COVID, they withdraw funding. And therefore, one of the key roles, and I will go into a little bit more detail into it afterwards, uh, one of the key roles that development banks played uh, during the global financial crisis, and they're beginning to play now under COVID, is to provide counter-cyclical finance, uh, which is much needed in difficult times. But uh, private financial markets have also other problems, other market failures, we can call. One is that they don't fund SMEs or small companies enough, and particularly they don't fund innovative companies, uh, which have, for example, very good ideas, but haven't got accumulated collateral or wealth. And going 
and also they don't provide long-term finance because uh, for example to build the infrastructure that is so key for developing countries uh, and emerging economies but also in, in in richer countries you need very long-term finance and they don't they are not very willing to provide the so-called patient capital so there's a number of market failures but going beyond market failures there is a need particularly today to have a very radical transformation of the economies so that it can become greener and more inclusive. And, and in that sense, financial markets are not very good at providing this kind of uh, uh, transformation of finance because they don't like to take too much risk. They don't like to innovate. Um, and uh, therefore, already historically, uh, many of the most successful countries worldwide uh, both developed and developing uh, have relied increasingly on development banks. We have the case of China in developing countries and South Korea, for example. We have Germany and France in, in Europe. And, and so it, it, it's, it's very interesting that uh, increasingly uh, both developed and developing countries are creating uh, additional development banks. Today in Europe, practically there is no country that doesn't have a development bank. And I have just recently, in the last month, heard that there are development banks being created in Ghana, and there's thought about creating a new infrastructure development bank in India. So uh, there, there is a, re a real renaissance, a rebirth of development banks, because as, as Joe Stiglitz would like to say, when the invisible hand of the market fails, maybe because it isn't really there, we need to move to the visible hand of government. Um, now, what was interesting is that after the global financial crisis, um, both national and multilateral and regional development banks sharply increased their funding. Um, and also, uh, the largest uh, multilateral development bank, the European Investment Bank, first had its capital doubled by its member states, and then it, uh, and it played a key role in what was called the Juncker Plan, which has generated, mobilized about 500 billion euros in five years. Um, at the same time, uh, in Asia, two major new development banks, regional development banks or multilateral development banks were created, the Asia in Investment Infrastructure Bank and the New Development Bank or the BRICS Bank. So we have, I think, from a more theoretical point of view, if you like, a sort of shift in the development finance paradigm where um, we have a more balanced public-private mix between public banks, public development banks owned by governments, although they may fund themselves on the private capital market, but owned and led by governments, and the private commercial banking system. In some ways, this was also the characteristic after the Second World War, where we had this kind of balance of this uh, development finance paradigm uh, that, that combined um, the, the best of um, of the public sector and the best of the private sector. And in fact, according to figures from the recent figures from the African Finance, uh, sorry, a, from AFD, the French Development Bank, there are now more than 400 development banks in the world. I'm thinking now about multilateral, regional, national, and subnational. And their total assets reach over $11 trillion which is actually very large because it's equivalent to about 70% of the entire U.S. banking sector. And each year, uh, these development banks worldwide commit over $2 trillion, which is equivalent to 10% of the world gross fixed capital formation. So it's actually a very large number already, and some of us think that they should be increased. And they perform five crucial roles. What, the first one is a counter-cyclical role, which compensates in part for the pro-cyclical nature of the private lending. And for example, in the, according to World Bank data, 
uh, national development banks between 2007 and 2009, that is the worst of the global financial crisis, increased their lending at, by 36%, while private banks were increasing it far less. And also, as I pointed out, the re regional and multilateral development banks were also increasing their commitments and their disbursements very significantly. And this, and this is important to stress, was facilitated by a significant increases in their capital, particularly the developed countries put on money to increase the capital. And this is important because at the moment there is no such commitment, for example, from the G20, uh, which are the largest uh, economies of the world. Um, and, and therefore, the, the response that, for example, the African Development Bank or the Inter-American Development Bank can make to the COVID crisis will be insufficient if this is not changed because they will have limited headroom to increase their operations so they're doing a very good job as i will mention in a minute but they are limited uh, by the, uh, the the restrictions on capital and this is actually absurd because um, if you increase capital, for example, in the case of the European Investment Bank, uh, it was doubled by 10 billion euros um, about 10 years ago, and that generated additional lending, both by the bank and by the private sector, through co-financing and other mechanisms, about 180 billion. So there, there's important leverage which can be achieved, and it's a good way for governments to spend their money. So that's the first role, is the counter-cyclic role. The second one is to fund innovation and in general to support structural transformation. So we need, we have an urgent need. Now we have two urgent needs. First, we have to help uh, countries and economies recover from this terrible COVID crisis, which of course in the developing world is threatening major setbacks. Uh, it's estimated in Latin America that the setback would be 15 years of, of achievements in, in the social and economic sectors could be set back by COVID. So there is recovery from COVID. And then there is, as I mentioned, the structural transformation urgently to make the economy much more low carbon worldwide and also to make it more inclusive because we know that uh, that there is growing inequality. But it's very important that such major transformations always require major investments and of a very innovative kind. And therefore, you, the need for development banks is much greater for both reasons, both for COVID reasons, but also for achieving this major structural transformation. And just to finish, uh, there are three other functions that I would like to mention. Um, that development banks have been fulfilling very well. One is to help with financial inclusion, particularly, for example, by lending to SMEs and smaller companies that have so much trouble getting private finance. Also by lending for long-term infrastructure, because often private sector finance is not available, particularly in poorer countries, particularly in riskier sectors. And finally, last, but perhaps most importantly, is to support global public goods and particularly mitigating and adapting to climate change. So um, we did a, a book with my colleague Jose, and friend Jose Antonio Campo, and there we evaluated development banks in seven countries, Germany, uh, China and five Latin American countries. And we concluded that development banks seem to be very successful at what they do, that they are very flexible, they can adjust to new challenges, uh, that they are a useful policy instrument to help overcome these major market failures. Um, and uh, in fact, one of the problems of the Washington consensus model was that governments had very few instruments. They could say, oh, we want to achieve this target, but then they didn't have any specific instruments to achieve it. And development banks are precisely such an instrument. They are very helpful for countries that have clear national development strategies because they can help fund them. And particularly now, given the commitments that countries are doing in the context of the Paris Agreement on climate change. They can support key new sectors like renewable energy and energy efficiency. 
And I think here I would like to mention the case of solar energy, um, which was started by one of the most successful development banks, which is the German KFW, which started practically on its own funding solar energy and then gradually uh, encouraged, seduced the private sector to start doing so. And then that was followed or in parallel by the China Development Bank, which is the largest development bank of all, has two and a, two and a half trillion dollars of assets. And that made a major contribution towards developing solar panels and making them very cheap. Uh, and then, of course, this had really an international externality because these cheap solar panels have been then introduced throughout the world and have made solar energy very competitive. So the, the work, if you like, that, that the KFW in Germany and the China Development Bank did in China have had these massive externalities. Um, so it, it seemed to us in this book and in later studies that it is a very key thing that governments can do, which is to expand developing development banks where they have them or create new ones if they don't exist. Uh, and of course, improve them as much as possible. Now, I want to very briefly uh, talk about the response to COVID. Um, and COVID, of course, is a, is a major crisis. It's a bigger crisis that, in terms of the impact on development, what most economists estimate. And, and it may have more damage on, on, on unemployment, on poverty, and setting back growth. And one of the major things in the short term is that there is a massive need for liquidity of companies uh, and therefore saving both companies and saving jobs, as well as continue with this aim of a medium term transformation, what has become called in the development bank world, build back better. And so uh, the development banks, I think, have responded very efficiently, we've started to study that. One of the things they have done is they switch because normally they provide long-term patient capital, 15, 20 years, but they realize that the needs of companies were mainly for uh, working capital. And so they have quickly developed instruments that, that provide very uh, significant amounts of working capital, short-term capital, often conditional, for example, the Brazilian Development Bank, on these companies maintaining jobs and not firing people and not cutting salaries. Uh, another thing is that they've been very good at fast tracking their procedures. And some banks, including, for example, the one in Berlin, where Uli is at the moment, actually is able to disperse within 24 hours. And a number of other banks, like the China Development Bank, are doing that. They've also been very active in, for example, promoting key sectors like the health sector. There's a lot of activity of development banks supporting crucial uh, elements. And finally, they have uh, also uh, done standstill elements. This links a bit into the issues that Uli will refer to in a minute, which is to, um, uh, they have been automatically rescheduling debts and postponing debt service payments to give more breathing space to companies. Now we, uh, with uh, Regis Maradon from AFD and Jose Antonio Campo, have, have written this piece that uh, that you have kindly put on the on the chat. And we argued in that piece that if development banks increase their transactions this year by 20% from their two trillion dollars, which is their normal level, that could generate an additional 400 billion dollars. And if you think about a lot of it would be co-financed with money that could be channeled from the private capital markets or private banks or private investors. You could generate at least 800 billion. You have a leverage of two. And that would be a major contribution to the gaps and needs, both of developed, emerging and developing countries. But as I mentioned before, this, the ability to do this would require some increase of capital as was done after the global financial crisis. And, and this would be extremely important. I, I should also uh, mention that there will be a major summit in mid-November, which was supposed to be in Paris, but it's going to probably be virtual, where all the development banks will convene for the first time 
under the leadership of uh, the French President Macron and also the UN Secretary General. And hopefully this summit will help promote further and improve the performance of development banks. If I have one minute, I would like to just say that though I'm a big fan of development banks, um, I think there is now one limitation emerging, which is that um, more conservative, super pro-market people uh, who have been in the past very critical of development banks now tend to accept them, which is a positive step. I think the World Bank used to be very critical. It sort of forgot that it was a development bank itself. Um, has started seeing them mainly as mobilizers of private finance. And the World Bank has this discourse, for example, that we should convert billions to trillions. Now, to achieve that, they want to use instruments that will give maximum leverage, which is fine to give a lot of leverage because you would mobilize more money. But they want to give maximum guarantees to take away what as they call de-risk the private sector to encourage the private sector to invest more. They want to assume all the risks on the public sector development banks books. And if, of course, the development banks have future losses, uh, it will be the taxpayers. It will be first the government, but indeed the, the taxpayers who will pay it. So I think one has to be very careful of this. And also, if, if, if they use such indirect and complex instruments, Nobody will exactly see where the risks are. And, and development banks and governments will lose this very precious tool, uh, which they have to a certain extent, because they will not be able to steer the resources towards um, the, the priorities of governments, like low carbon economy, more inclusive economy. And this is, I think, quite a serious risk. So. Um, you know, I, I welcome the fact that uh, that uh, there is such increased support, there is such an increased renaissance of development banks. But I think we have to be very careful about the instruments which they use and the purposes to which the funds are channeled. Thank you very much, and I, I really look forward to uh, Uli's presentation and to your comments and discussions and questions. Thank you, Isabel, and uh, great pleasure to speak after Stephanie. I hope you can hear me well. Very well. Okay, good. So, um, as, as was mentioned at the start, I will uh, cover the, the global financial safety net and also talk a little bit about debt, although I, probably I, I will not get very much into that uh, because of time. So, um, first of all, I, I very much uh, agree with, with, with uh, things uh, Stephanie said about the role, the very important role of development banks, development finance institutions, and also her reservations regarding um, these billions to trillions agenda uh, and the associated problems. Um, so it, it is very clear that the crisis has a, uh, an enormous impact on the global economy and obviously then also uh, developing and emerging economies. and. Um, so I, I apologize that I will be talking kind of in general about developing and emerging economies. So I'm not going to, to look into differences. And of course, there are uh, big differences uh, among this group, but, but uh, so I'll be a bit, bit general and broad. Um, but um, uh, I mean, all of them, uh, speaking in general terms, have been hit uh, by the shutdown of, uh, shutdown of borders, collapse of tourism, and international passenger travel, disruption of trade and investment, um, and uh, indeed uh, also the collapse of economic activity uh, in the advanced countries, which, which are of course important export destinations. Um, they have also been hit by crumbling commodity prices uh, and contraction of remittances, um, uh, which the World Bank estimates to be around 20% uh, down this year. Uh, and this is quite a significant amount, around um, uh, almost $500 billion that are uh, uh, missing uh, because of that. Um, importantly, developing and emerging economies have also experienced 
large-scale capital outflows uh, in March, April this year. And uh, these were indeed um, the largest ever capital outflows, uh, portfolio capital outflows uh, on record. So um, there's been a lot of comparison between the current crises and the 2008 financial crisis, which also merged into a global crisis. But um, the, the speed and scale of capital outflows from developing emerging economies has been on a much greater scale um, and it has also led, for example, to in part large scale depreciation of exchange rates. So there have been a, a number of countries, including Angola, South Africa, Shells, um, Zambia and Brazil, who have seen their currencies tumble by more than 20 percent. So the Brazilian real even uh, declined by uh, 30 percent. Um, so this obviously has, has important uh, implications. Um, by now, the situation has, has stabilized um, uh, quite a bit, which is not least in, uh, uh, due to the large scale intervention we've seen from central banks, um, both in advanced countries and in developing emerging economies. Um, the, in, in, in early March, uh, the financial markets of the major advanced countries were basically close to, implo uh, close to implosion. I mean, this is not an exaggeration. They were really close to, to completely um, uh, collapsing. And uh, it was only due to massive interventions by the Federal Reserve, the ECB, and other large um, uh, uh, central banks of the advanced countries uh, that, that kind of stabilized the situation. Uh, and uh, it was also around that time that, that developing emerging countries experienced the largest capital outflows. There was really a rush out of these markets, uh, partly because uh, financial uh, uh, firms in advanced countries try to, to, to remain liquid and, and survive, um, uh, and partly because of uh, a higher risk aversion in developing emerging countries. Um, so. There was certainly an important role of central banks uh, stabilizing the domestic economy, and that, that certainly applies also to developing emerging countries where many uh, central banks uh, rapidly lower interest rates. Uh, an increasing number of emerging market central banks has also um, implemented now quantitative easing policies. So that's the novum. Uh, that was what, what uh, beforehand only uh, a number of uh, advanced central banks would do. So we're in a completely new new um, territory uh, with this now. Um, importantly, there were also some actions by central banks, uh, by, by the major leading central banks to stabilize the situation. Uh, the Federal Reserve Bank created uh, swap lines. So that is basically, it, it provided uh, the opportunity to other central banks uh, to exchange domestic currency to dollar, and the dollar is, of course, uh, the, the world's uh, the most important currency. Uh, the problem here is, however, uh, that only initially a small group of advanced countries uh, did these swap lines. Um, so uh, the ECB, the Bank of England, the Bank of Japan, uh, Canadian, Swiss, and uh, they received these uh, swap lines from the Fed, uh, and then. Uh, with a bit of delay, um, this was uh, extended to a total of 14 countries, but again, this only included two emerging market economies, Brazil and Mexico, um, just showing that um, this kind of international support is only granted to a very uh, limited, exclusive club of countries. And um, uh, most, by far the most, uh, of the developing emerging countries had no such lifeline uh, to get liquidity when, when they needed it. Um, and the crisis, broadly speaking, has shown how shaky the, the current uh, international global financial safety net uh, really is. So this global financial safety net, uh, it's not a formal uh, uh, safety net, but it's, it's a kind of uh, an assembly of different uh, layers. Um, so that involves uh, foreign exchange reserves that national central banks are holding as a kind of uh, war chest. 
uh, if they need to, to stabilize their currencies or need to intervene in foreign exchange markets. Um, then these bilateral central bank swap lines, of which the ones with the US Fed are arguably the most important ones, but there are other ones, uh, People's Bank of China uh, has extended um, um, uh, swap arrangements with, with quite a number of countries. Um, uh, and then importantly, uh, there is the International Monetary Fund, uh, which is kind of um, the provider of, of, of uh, liquidity on the global level. And then we also have a group of regional financing arrangements, uh, such as FLAR in Latin America, uh, or the Chiang Mai Initiative Multilateralization in uh, Asia, um, which are also supposed to, to provide liquidity in crisis situations to countries. Now, the problem is that um, the availability of funds of these different layers is much smaller uh, than the needs we see in a crisis situation that, that uh, we have seen just now. So um, uh, the IMF and Jungtat both have estimated that uh, liquidity needs amounted to around $2.5 trillion. Um, roughly speaking, these different layers of, of the global financial safety net add up to around uh, $1.5 trillion. Um, but only about two thirds, so about one trillion, uh, would be available to um, developing emerging uh, countries. Um, so we have a bit of a mismatch between uh, what is available um, uh, within this global financial safety net and, and the potential needs of crisis during a truly global uh, crisis. Um, but then there's also um, the question on, on uh, around the conditions under which these funds are available. And um, so, for example, the, the um, uh, support from the IMF usually is only available under uh, relative, uh, fairly strict conditionality. Um, the fund has responded in a, in a um, very pragmatic way, I would say, uh, this time trying to provide as much as uh, quick li liquidity as possible. Um, but Arguably, there could have been much more. And um, I have definitely mentioned already that in, in the 2008 crisis, the G20 kind of emerged as a leading force uh, in uh, uh, yeah, kind of trying to stabilize the global, uh, global financial markets and, and supporting uh, the world economy. Um, this time, we also had some big declarations. So, for example, the G20. Uh, in April, uh, had a meeting where they issued a statement where they promised, and I quote, uh, to do whatever it takes to use all available policy tools to minimize economic and social damage from the pandemic, restore global growth, maintain market stability, and strengthen resilience. Um, however, the, the concrete steps that were taken were rather uh, disappointing. Um, so there was an agreement to um, double uh, the emergency facilities from uh, of the IMF to $100 billion. So this is important. So there has been uh, $100 billion that, that could go out to uh, mostly low-income countries at, at low conditionality. Um, uh, but that was meant for, for countries with, with very strong policies and fundamentals. Um, the G20 also agreed on a debt stand, uh, temporary debt standstill for 2020, which again was important, uh, but um, arguably uh, not enough. And I'll get back to that uh, in a moment. And that applies only to public debt. And but in terms of providing uh, a big liquidity boost to the world economy and, and developing emerging countries in particular, uh, the G20 has not delivered. Uh, and this stands in, in contrast to the response uh, that we've seen after from the G20 uh, in, in 2009 um, during the global financial crisis or North Atlantic financial crisis, as some like to call it, um, where the, the G20 agreed on the issuance of $250 billion of SDRs. So SDRs are special drawing rides. Um, they are basically 
uh, an international monetary asset that can be created by the IMF. So the IMF can act as a kind of central bank for the world and create this new uh, monetary asset. Um, SDRs are based on a basket of currencies. So it's the major, uh, the world's leading currencies, including, of course, uh, the dollar, uh, the, the, uh, the euro, uh, the pound is still in there as well. Uh, the, the renminbi has uh, become a constituency currency of the uh, SDRs um, some while ago, and of course also the Japanese yen. Um, and the IMF has the authority to create um, unconditional liquidity with these SDRs. So it can create this money and then this will be allocated to every member country. Um, so theoretically, this would be exactly what we need right now, yeah, this boost of liquidity. Um, the problem, however, um, is that um, uh, at least 85% uh, of uh, the, the fund's membership needs to agree on the issuance of new, I, uh, of new SDRs. And the problem is that uh, the largest member country of the IMF, uh, which is the US government, uh, has a 15 percent uh, uh, kind of uh, is, can can block this because they have more than 15 percent. So um, and and this is exactly what happened during uh, the spring meetings in April. Um, the the U.S. basically argued that uh, SDRs are not an effective tool uh, and therefore blocked the issuance of new SDRs. And um, so let me just give you the, the uh, quotation from the U.S. Treasury uh, Secretary Mnuchin, uh, who argued that, and I quote, uh, SDRs were not an effective tool to respond to urgent needs um, because almost 70 percent of an allocation would be provided to G20 countries, most of which do not need and would not use additional SDRs to respond to the crisis. By contrast, all low income countries, including those facing urgent balance payment needs, would receive just 3% of the allocation. And he is, of course, right that SDRs uh, would be allocated according to uh, the quotas, that's basically the, the share the member countries have with the IMF. Um, however, um, close to two fifths of uh, the, the IMF quota, so the shares of the IMF are held by developing and emerging countries. So two thirds of newly created SDR would go to developing emerging countries. And of course, not all of them are in dire need uh, of new SDRs, but, but um, I would actually say uh, many, I mean, most of them uh, could really do well with the new SDR allocation, even if it's only to boost their, their reser reserve uh, um, uh, uh, holdings. Um, but moreover, and uh, this is something that I have put forward with uh, colleagues, uh, including uh, Jose Antonio Campo and Kevin Gallagher and Haya uh, Hong uh, Gao, um, we, we proposed an issuance of at least $500 billion uh, in March. Um, and we suggested that uh, advanced countries and also emerging countries that do not need this SDR liquidity could provide it to the IMF so that the IMF could boost its own lending power uh, and basically uh, also increase its own uh, liquidity provision to the world economy. So there are ways of, of using SDRs um, uh, to provide more liquidity. Um, unfortunately, uh, the US and, and India was the second country that, that opposed an SDR issuance, um, were opposing that, and uh, the reasons seem to be rather petty. Um, so SDRs are unconditional. Every member of the IMF gets it, which also means that countries like Venezuela and Iran uh, or Pakistan uh, would get an SDR issuance. And, um, uh, this may not be in the direct interest of, of uh, the US or in the case of Pakistan, uh, India. And uh, so in a way, uh, a very ele elegant solution to providing more liquidity to the global economy has been 
uh, made impossible because of uh, rather uh, narrow uh, interest from countries. Um, and I would argue that, that there still is a very strong case for issuing uh, new special drawing rights. Um, and uh, so uh, the European countries, for example, which have been all very positive, uh, I think they should be putting forward a proposal for a mechanism how they would reallocate their SDRs to basically uh, negate uh, uh, Mnuchin's uh, official reasons for, for um, opposing it. Um, uh, so we're moving ahead with time. So I, I will I will um, finish very soon. I'll just uh, make a few comments on on debt. Um, already before the COVID crisis hit, uh, the IMF and the World Bank, which are doing regular assessments on uh, debt sustainability, so, so of uh, public debt of of um, uh, developing emerging countries, uh, they um, came to the conclusion last autumn that. Uh, around half of all low income countries uh, were considered in, in well, they were considered in debt distress or at high risk of debt distress and uh, more broadly um, around uh, 60 developing and emerging countries have been facing issues with debt sustainability. So even before the COVID crisis hit, um, there was a, a developing uh, um, a debt problem in the emerging world. And uh, now, of course, with, with COVID having hit them, these countries very hard, uh, and also having created the need for large scale fiscal stimulus, I mean, wherever large scale was possible. And we, we can see that uh, developing emerging countries have had more timid fiscal response compared to advanced countries, uh, because basically they have limited fiscal rule, uh, room. Um, but, but um, uh, this obviously will, will uh, further uh, create problems regarding debt sustainability. Um, we did mention already that there is a, a, a temporary debt stim, a standstill for uh, debt to official um, uh, creditors. So that's basically the G20 countries and, and uh, public institutions. But um, this applies to 77 uh, of the poorest countries. Um, but there are still uh, discussions going on about including the private sector. And uh, so there are, uh, this is, this is uh, um, an area that needs urgent attention, much more effort to solve this problem. Um, and it also, I think, is a good reminder that we urgently need uh, to develop um, a proper sovereign debt restructuring mechanism. Uh, this has been in discussion uh, for, well, 30 years at least, um, but there has never been really um, uh, an agreement on, on, on putting this into practice. And I do think uh, we urgently need to uh, work on such a uh, um, debt restructuring mechanism. Uh, I think in the face of the climate crisis, we also need to, to um, have discussions about uh, uh, climate debt in such a discussion, uh, I'm not going into that now because that, that would take another, um, well, a couple of minutes would not even be enough. But anyway, uh, so let me finish here. But um, so I think um, even though the situation has stabilized to a certain degree now, um, we are still facing uh, severe problems uh, on the fiscal side in the developing emerging world, uh, both uh, with respect to shorter term liquidity, but also structural issues around debt sustainability. And uh, this will, will, will have to be on the agenda uh, going forward. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, both of you. And now I'm going to, to ask you so, uh, different questions that they have, that people that have been watching us are asking. Okay, so. There are two about development banks. Alex is, is asking about the World Bank leverage and risk, and it's for Stephanie. So um, a recent ODI report on, blended, on blended, blended finance looks at the leverage ratios for the IDA, IFC, and MIGA, and they found leverage ratios between 1 and 0 0.7. One can assume these institutions to follow the World Bank doctrine, for maximizing leverage. The question here is then, 
How will development banks in your scenario mobilize private finance at a one-one ratio without radically mo removing the risks for the private sectors as the World Bank advocates? Stephanie, you have to turn on your microphone. So would you like me to answer that, try and answer that question first? Or do you want to give me the other question? OK, I can give you the other question as well. OK, so the other question is about the Wall Street consensus and development banks. Uh, Marie is asking Wall that you may- Wall Street or Washington? Sorry, Wall Street or Washington? Wall Street consensus. OK. Um, so she's saying that you mentioned in the end of your presentation the billions to trillions agenda and touch upon the consequence of that. Earlier in the series, we heard from Daniela Gabor, who spoke about this development and what she, co and what she calls the Wall Street consensus and the shift in development finance to one of the risking development projects to attract private financial flows and feed the appetite of private investors. Do you believe this tendency will strengthen in the years to come and that development banks m might fundamentally change because of it? Okay, well, very, very interesting questions. I, I think I'll start with the second one. Um, okay. I'm actually a close colleague of Daniela Gabor and I broadly agree with her. Um, maybe she's a bit more radical than me, but that's always a good thing. Um, I think there is a fight going on between more of you like Keynesian development economists who want to use development banks for what they were set up as vehicles to channel funds, including very much private funds, for development purposes. And particularly now for uh, purposes of greening the economy, uh, achieving a low carbon economy, which is such an urgent task but also make it more equal and also uh, making these countries more dynamic. So taking what I call economic risks, you know, the kind of risks that Mariana Masucato talks about in terms of uh, taking risks in new technologies, new products, new regions, which are good risks to take. And it's, it's great that development banks take more risk when the private sector doesn't want to. But there's another kind of risk, which I, I call financial engineering risk, which is in the design of the financial instruments and which are not uh, desirable. They have the advantage that they may sometimes create more leverage and therefore generate more resources. And that's why they're sold to governments as a good thing. But they also take risks away from the private sector. They don't de-risk they redistribute risk. Yeah? It's wrong to say that they de-risk because what they do, they transfer the risk from the public to the, from the private to the public sector. And in some cases, that's fine. For example, if you have regulatory risk, which is that the government, for example, in an infrastructure project could change the rules of the game or that a public utility, when it buys, say, electricity, uh, doesn't increase the price as much as was in, in, in the agreement of the initial contract for the investment. And therefore, it's good for governments to step in and guarantee that. But governments shouldn't take the commercial risk. That's what capitalism is for, and that's what capitalists are about. They should assume the risk. So I think there is this tendency of calling the risking, but actually putting risk on the public sector balance sheets. And I think there is a big argument about this. And, and, uh, and I'm definitely on the same side as Daniela and many others, Uli agrees and many others agree, that we should use development banks for development. I mean, their main aim is to maximize development impact. And of course, having more leverage is an important uh, uh, instrument for that, but it must not be at the sacrifice of absorbing too much risk from the private sector. I, I hope that, that this will be, and first it needs to be understood because sometimes this is all hidden. It's all a bit opaque behind these very complicated instruments. Financial sector is always very good at doing that. It creates these very complicated instruments which it itself doesn't understand. And then they say, no, 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 you can't give opinions because you're not experts. But 
I think the underlying principles are clear in the work that academics and NGOs and others in the development community can make are, is very important. I think, for example, in Europe, there is a more cautious approach. The European Investment Bank is also very keen on leverage, but I have been studying it and talking to people there. And my impression is that they have a more, I feel like, continental European approach, more of German, French approach, and not this wild Anglo Saxon approach of trying always to satisfy everything that the private financial sector wants. So I'm 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 quite optimistic about uh, about uh, but but I think we need to remain vigilant. Um, I I haven't read the the ODI report on blended finance, but I think this is on a different issue. I think about how um, how the World Bank leverages its its funds also depends for example on how uh, guarantees and other instruments are accounted for in terms of their capital and i think clearly uh, the world bank could leverage more uh, for example the ifc has interesting in instruments for leveraging um, but i think it is very important on how again blended finance is used because blended finance means using public public money and is it is it a good way to use public money for guaranteeing risks of the private sector or is it a better use to for example give cheaper credit to small farmers and so on or to subsidize investment in the green economy so i think uh, uh, one would have to look at it very carefully how concessional resources within blended finance are used and, and what are the specific mechanisms and what is the specific development impact? That is always the key question to ask. Not the financial result of a development bank, although it's important, not even the level of leverage, but the total development impact. And the main risk for a development bank is, is not to achieve enough development impact. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. I have two other questions for you. Um, uh -huh. One of them is that in the current India Indian scenario, mainly indicating towards the employment and massive financial and, and liquidity constraint of the common people, what role can be played by development banks directly or indirectly to support or help improve this, the, this scenario? I, I can hear you. Okay. Can you hear me? Um, uh, if you could very quickly repeat, maybe it would be good. Because yes. Okay, so this is about the role of development banks in relieving COVID-19 consequences in India. So in the current Indian scenario, main, mainly indicating towards the unemployment, unemployment and massive financial and liquidity constraint of the common people, what role can be played? by the development banks directly or indirectly to support or help improve the scenario. Okay. And then the other question is um, that it before you were talking about uh, that some goods should be provided globally, as for example, health, and how do you think that, the, that this can happen with the high level of public debt that each country is facing right now? Okay, so I, I think on the first question, of course, uh, I think we have to think about it in the broader context that, that Uli raised, because we have to look at all the policy instruments that say the Indian government can deploy, um, uh, including monetary and fiscal policy, international support that, that India can get, and development banks would play some role within that. Uh, I think that in the time of the Washington Consensus, unfortunately, uh, India used to have quite a good system of development banks, but a lot of them have been uh, shut down or uh, diminished. So, so the firepower which they have in, in terms of helping uh, for the very important aims that were asked is, is a bit limited. But I, I was very encouraged because I've been invited actually to to a webinar um, next week where, this is a little bit confidential maybe, where there are serious studies of recreating some kind of infrastructure investment bank in India because they saw that the private financial markets weren't doing the jobs. So I think uh, 
you know, the, the, the less development banks you have, or the smaller they are, you can contribute less, particularly in these moments of crisis, when, when a development bank can help so much in countries like Germany, for example, KFW in China, it used to be in Brazil, although it's smaller, but even a very conservative government in Brazil is using the Bendes quite significantly. In the case of India, they don't have such a big one, and so they will have to recur more, I think, to direct fiscal policy, monetary policy, maybe financial regulatory policy to try and overcome the situation. Uh, the second question, I think, is a little bit of confusion between public goods and high level of public debt. Public goods are, are goods uh, which uh, where the social returns or the environmental returns are higher than the, the commercial returns. For example, climate change. So if you were thinking of uh, avoiding climate change or limiting it to 1.5 degrees, uh, you would need to have a higher price of carbon than you do now internationally. And while you don't, you have to have direct interventions by governments or by regulators. And, that, and therefore, for example, you can finance uh, activities which would not be normally commercially profitable because the prices are distorted but uh, but are very important from a public good po point of view and this is a separate issue from the issue of high public debt but high public debt is very important because the fact that the developed countries are going to have by the end of the year debt to gdp according to the imf estimates of about 130 percent of gdp and the levels of debt will also go up uh, in the developing countries because they need to expand economic activity uh, may create future problems. But at the moment, I think the key issue is not debt uh, because we can then think about how it can be forgiven or grown out of. But the main issue is how to increase spending by governments to ensure that they are uh, providing enough incentives to support employment and to support companies not going bankrupt. And if, if I may come in here, and I know we, we are running out of time, but I'd just like to emphasize, following up on, 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 on these points, which I fully share. Um, so we are, of course, facing right now this, this uh, pandemic, um, which is a terrible health crisis. Um, but we are also facing the climate crisis. And the problem is um, we have around a decade left to fundamentally decarbonize our economies, because um, otherwise uh, we will not succeed really in limiting uh, global warming to 1.5 centigrade or even 2. Point centigrade. And, and scientists tell us that uh, everything beyond 2 centigrade will, will really be catastrophic. I mean, uh, 2 degrees will be bad enough and 1.5 degrees will also come with significant effects which we can already see to a certain degree um, so the problem is um, we, we need very urgent investment in decarbonization of our economies um, and uh, uh, having uh, low carbon infra uh, infrastructure especially energy infrastructure and so the big challenge is that we need to make sure that all the money we spend now in stabilizing the economy uh, trying to get a recovery going uh, needs to also take these long-term, these very, very important long-term go long goals into consideration. And I think that actually is also one reason why uh, we need uh, to see uh, an important role of public uh, banks and development banks in particular, uh, because we don't have the time really to wait uh, a decade to find completely market-based solutions to, to, to kind of get this change going. Uh, and this is not to say that we don't want to have the market involved. And of course, we do need market mechanisms such as carbon pricing in a very meaningful way. Uh, but we definitely need to also to have a hands-on approach using public banks to, to uh, uh, shore up investment. And very importantly, uh, for many climate vulnerable countries, there are already now very little uh, possibilities to undertake the investment uh, research we have done uh, has shown that these countries actually face a risk premium already on uh, borrowing uh, uh, money from capital markets. So 
we need um, public support among others through the form uh, of, of development bank intervention uh, in getting uh, the right investments into resilience, into adaptation uh, going. Um, so so uh, just to, to back up uh, on, on, on Stephanie's very good comments. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. So we're basically done. Thank you very much, Stephanie and Uwitz, for presenting. Um, to Sarah, Janice, and Anne Marie, who have been organizing these amazing seminars. And to everyone else who has contributed. And thank you. Thank yes, you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.